where men spout kerosene. Magicians defy gravity. A world of mind-bending contortionists. Where pigs do math. And ladies twirl fire. Are you ready for amazing entertainment unlike any you've seen before? Are you ready for learned pigs and fireproof women? Learned Pigs and Fireproof Women is hosted by Ricky Jay with special guest stars comedian Elaine Boozler, Olympic gold medalist Matt Biondi, and a special appearance by Steve Martin. Tonight, you'll share in the extraordinary skills of a master puppeteer, a bafflingly strong woman, a symphonic glass player, a crystal ball juggler, a human computer, an astonishing quick change artist, and a priceless mechanical marvel. Do you think that's good? For a finale, Orville lays on the ground, they put a piano on his chest, the piano player stands on his thighs and pounds out the accompaniment while he sings, Ireland must be heaven, because mother comes from there. One minute to curtain, Mr. Jacks. <laughs> Keep it up, Slingo. You know, Ricky, in all the years we've been friends, you've been telling me about these acts. I'm so excited. I'm finally going to see them. I hope you saved me a good seat. My dear, you have the best seat in the house. Have a good show, smooth talker. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Steve Martin. Since the first caveman, Wog, accidentally killed himself by swallowing flaming fire sticks in order to amuse his fellow cave persons, people have been looking for new and ever more original ways to entertain their fellow man. And never, I repeat, never in the annals of entertainment has one man devoted himself more dutifully, studied so scrupulously, and documented so diligently these eccentric, bizarre, and astonishing feats of physical and mental daring-do than the man they call America's scholar of the unusual, magician, author, bon vivant, raconteur, prestidigitator extraordinaire, and a personal friend to whom I no longer owe a favor, Ricky Jay. Thanks, Steve. Steve will be back a little later with an act that certainly qualifies as unique. You know, from the time I was a child learning magic at my grandfather's knee, my life's passion has been strange and unusual entertainers. I've traveled around the world searching out artists of astonishing skill and accomplishment, both live and those preserved on film. <laughs> ready to assume my rightful position as the man who throws ordinary playing cards higher, harder, faster, and farther than anyone in the world. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to throw cards this evening, but unfortunately, this theater is much too small. You know, I wrote a book about self-defense with ordinary playing cards in which I discussed the methods and reasons why one should always carry a deck of cards. First, they're inexpensive. <laughs> Secondly, if you're good with them, you can make a small fortune before the actual attack. <laughs> Third, there have been no recorded busts for carrying cards as a concealed weapon. <laughs> but for those of you who prefer skill to verbiage, I will, in fact, throw one. 
Don't let these hit you. If they do, you'll want to sue me, and I'm not a wealthy man. <laughs> I'm going to try to get one all the way back in the balcony. Thank you very much. But I know what you're saying. Sure, this man can throw cards with incredible speed and accuracy, but can he throw a card and make it return back to his hand a simulacrum of the Australian boomerang? <laughs> I know what you're saying. Sure, you can throw a card and catch it when it returns to your hand. But can you, upon that card's return, Cut it neatly in half with a pair of giant scissors. <laughs> yes, I can. If anyone here has a pair of giant does anyone here have a pair of giant scissors? I do. <laughs> and I might add, I feel so much better now. <laughs> Here's the way this works. I throw the card in the air. When it returns, I cut it neatly in half with a... I should point out, if you're attacked by a pair of giant scissors, you may throw a card at them, disabling them completely. <laughs> but for those of you who prefer skill to verbiage, I will, in fact... <laughs> well, on my way to the luckiest night of my life. I know what you're saying. Sure, you can throw cards and cut them neatly in half upon their return, but can you defend yourself against plastic? <laughs> if you're ever attacked by an animal band or a band of animals, fire! Yes! 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 <laughs> Chapter 7, Self-Defense Against Plastics. This seemingly mild-mannered plastic duck once took a small portion of my anatomy home with him. I keep him around as a reminder of how difficult life on the road can be. <laughs> if you're attacked by a plastic duck, I suggest three methods of self-defense. First, the stare. <laughs> Next, the bold gesture. Not doable on television. <laughs> Finally, fire at the duck. Yes! This is something I do early in my show because it dissuades would-be hecklers. I know what you're saying. Sure, you can defend yourself against plastic, but can you defend yourself against fruits? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I can, and many times I have. I will not waste your time this evening with kumquats, pears, or prunes. No, no, no. Ladies and gentlemen, the most prodigious of household fruits, you guessed it, the watermelon. <laughs> out of season and dreadfully expensive. Watch as I try to penetrate the juicy, rich red interior of said melon with a perfectly placed shot from an ordinary playing card. Yats! 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 Why is he still doing this? Yats! Ladies and gentlemen, Please notice that my last two shots penetrated exactly the same slit in the watermelon. A feat so impressive, I am forced to mention it myself. <laughs> but I know what you're saying. You're saying, sure, you're able to throw cards into the rich red interior of said melon. But can you penetrate the even thicker pachydermatous outer melon layer? <laughs> of course not. Who could do that? <laughs> but encouraged by your approbation, I will attempt to penetrate the even thicker pachydermatous outer melon layer. Watch. Yes! This scares the melon. <laughs> This wounds the melon. <laughs> this ticks me off. <sighs> My last card. Follow me. 
crazy entertainers, I've always had a special regard for jugglers. At its best, juggling is an art which combines grace, beauty, and a breathtaking disregard for the law of gravity. There was Cinque Valli, who caught a 44-pound wash tub on top of his German helmet. Acosta, who wore a piano on his head. Salerno, the alphabet juggler. And Conscious, the torpedo catcher. But now a modern juggler who is truly an artist. An artist whose work I've watched evolve over many years. A man so different and original, he has redefined the terms of his profession. Michael Motion. and the great blind eating. What was going to do that? Sometimes through daredeviltry, sometimes through sheer artistry. Before. Actually, she comes from a long tradition. 
Take Signora Giardelli, for example. In 1818, she went into a blazing oven with two raw steaks in her hand. She emerged tartare. The steaks were cooked to perfection. <laughs> Come here, there's someone I'd like you to meet. This is Megan Rizel, who we brought in from Belgium, who does one of the most amazing acts in the world. Megan Elaine Boosley. Belgium. Hi, nice to meet you. You're not going to believe this, but Megan is one of the strongest people in the world. Well, no offense, but that's a little hard to believe. Well, not in the traditional sense, but she does possess the odic force. Oh, so that's where the odic force went. <laughs> Megan will show you an act made famous by Lulu Hurst, this incredibly strong woman who did this wonderful act in the 1880s. She was called the Georgia Magnet. I read about Lulu Hurst in your book. She was less than 100 pounds, and she could resist the strength of the strongest men in the world. You do that? Well, I'd like to show you, Elaine. If Ricky will just get that broomstick, we can demonstrate something right here. OK. This will be great. I'll test my strength here by having you push against Just it. Just push? Yeah, go ahead. OK. Push, Elaine. Right. I'm push, push. <laughs> I'm pushing. What are you, my Lamaze coach? Look, I need help. <laughs> uh, I'll get you some help. OK. Mike, come on over. Look, I want the two of you to do this. Uh, Michael seems like he might be a bit stronger than you are. Michael's not big enough, so I'll give you a little help. You all know Matt Biondi, who won five gold medals in the Seoul Olympics, a great Olympic swimmer. Matt's about 6'7", 215 or 20 pounds, and Matt's going to help as well. So I've got Michael, who's about 6'5", and Matt's 6'7", and Megan Rizel, who weighs maybe 100 pounds and a little more than five feet tall. I know this sounds incredible, but you're going to actually push against Megan and be absolutely unable to budge her. Megan? All right, and I'll make it a little easier for you. I'll stand on one foot. <laughs> oh, gonna... don't let her do this, guys. <laughs> Come on. Oh. God, that is amazing. It's almost going to snap the broomstick. It's <laughs> truly impressive. I mean, I think this woman is super glued to the floor. No, really, nothing. No, this is all based on a remarkable physical skill. This is exactly the kind of thing that I write about in the book, and it's truly amazing to me. I'm going to try another stunt. Matt, try to pick Megan up. Grab her by the waist and just try to lift her up right in the air. Lift her right up. No big deal. Ah. Megan, this time when you try it, will you actually resist Matt's attempts? Yes. Just one moment. All right. Wow, that's amazing. Isn't it? I mean, it... how does she do that? It's the Odic Force. Truly amazing. Matt, All right. thanks so much for helping. I really appreciate it. So, Megan, who's your Odic Force guy? Do you look this up in the yellow pages? Is there a store? You just go in and ask for some Odic Force? Here's some rare backstage footage of an early quick change act. The most renowned quick change artist in vaudeville was the legendary Owen McGivney. I'm really proud to introduce his son, Michael McGivney. Good to see you. Michael, good to see you. Thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure, believe me. I know your father wasn't just a quick change act, he was also a very accomplished actor. He appeared in films like Pat and Mike and Brigadoon, but of course he'll always be famous for playing all five characters in Dickens' Oliver Twist. Maybe you could explain to the audience exactly how you do all those blisteringly fast changes. Oh, absolutely not. Those are trade secrets. Amazing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, remember what you're about to see is just Michael with absolutely no camera trickery. And now an unparalleled exponent of donning, doffing, and divesting, Michael McGivney's Oliver Twist with a cast of one. Michael is enacting the end of the story. With Oliver away, Nancy has decided to inform on Fagin's gang, and the dangerous Bill Sykes is determined to strike back. Hi there, is there no one about? Fagin. Fagin? Curse the man, he'll have us all hanged. Damnation! It's Nancy, she mustn't find me here. I must hide. The sleeping sound I've not been missed. But you awaken soon, I'd better have the place ready. Damn it. The bottle, it's empty. And you'll want some when he wakes. I think I'd better slip out and get some before he wakes. Who is it? <laughs> Hello, Fagin. <laughs> Bill! Hey, 
begging for a strange smell. Uh, laudanum, a sleeping potion? What? It's Nancy. She's given Bill a sleeping potion. <laughs> Wake up, Bill. I've something. Cassius Fagan caution. If I awaken him, he'll flare up like a tiger. <laughs> I'll awaken you. You dearly love a joke, don't you? <laughs> I'll awaken you with the sound of this here falling crowbar. The only person you're seeing is Michael. Nothing is speeded up, and there is no camera trickery. Curse it. What was that? What the devil's come over me? I could have swore I heard someone in there. Someone's in. And by God, I'll have an out. On us, Bill, she's informed on us all. Fool. Fool. My God, you old fool. What did he say? Nancy tried to poison laudanum hellfire. Nancy, what have you been up to? Why, she's gone. In form. Well, I'll find you, and I'll uh, grind your brains to dust. <laughs> Stood in the shadows, he rushed past with a terrible look in his eye. He said, Am I working this night? I'm as good as dead. It's all horrible. It's all horrible. <laughs> Open the door. Steve, it was so good of you to come. Oh, it's my pleasure, Ricky. And of course, when I heard you were doing a show on the greatest entertainers of all time, I naturally wanted to be here. Well, Steve, we all know you're one of the greatest entertainers of all time. Oh, I'm not talking about myself, Ricky. I'm talking about my grandfather, who truly was one of the greatest entertainers that ever lived. Your grandfather? Now, who was your grandfather? The great Flydini. Your grandfather was the great Flydini? <laughs> I've been searching for memorabilia on him. I've been trying to run down his act for years. Well, actually, I have some old footage of him right here. I didn't know footage existed. Come with me. We've got to put this on right away. I thought you'd be pleased. 
I have this one rare Flydini play, Bill, but... You know, I've searched archives all over the world. I've never come up with anything on him. How did you find this? Well, my mother was cleaning out her attic, and she found it, and I rushed right down and bought it from her. Well, let's take a look at it. did this on the Sullivan show, but they only shot him from the waist up. I don't know, Ricky. That's what worries me. I just don't know. Hmm. How'd it go, Mildred? Not so good. He wouldn't do the wheelie. Show business. Next, an extraordinary puppeteer as Learned Biggs continues. In the world of unusual entertainment, which I call learned pigs and fireproof women, backstage traditions are as important as those represented on stage. Case in point, the backstage poker game. Okay, it's Anaconda, Jacks are wild. Anaconda, I'll show you a poker game that you'll really like. When I was up in Alaska doing that research, you know, on yeah. Daniel Wildman, the equestrian beekeeper, they played a wonderful <laughs> kind of poker. I've never seen this before. They take half the deck face up and half the deck face down. I know this sounds crazy. And then you actually shuffle the cards together, and a lot. I mean, you really shuffle them together face up and face down. I mean, it's, it seems like it's an odd thing to do, but you keep doing this. All right, and then you're playing a combination at the poker table. I mean, your combination is basically that of draw and stud. 
Whatever card you cut to, I'll deal to Cloud. All right, so that's fine. She'd get this card, which is face up, and you'd get a card, which is face up, and so would Cat and Mike. And I just happen to have a card face down. It'd be face up or face down. Yeah. King and the queen, ten, two spades, possible flush is the king. You would have preferred. I just happen to have a card face down. <laughs> Remember, they could be face up or just face down. They're just filling out the hands. Pair of sevens, fair. I just happen to have a card face down. So Jack over here, pair of tens, very strong. I got a lot of competition this time in line. I just happen to have a card face down. Remember, I started by taking yeah. half the deck face yeah, up and half the deck face down. That's what's so strange, because there are no other face down cards in the deck at all. And if you like to win, I suppose this isn't a bad hand to have. All yeah. four aces. Oh. I guess I take this, guys. All right. See you later. Have fun. These exquisite figures were all made by a man who's among the world's master puppeteers, Bruce Schwartz. Hi. Hi. Over the years we've been friends, I've seen you do so many forms of puppetry, but these seem particularly unusual. Can you tell us a little about them? These are wheel puppets. It's kuruma ningyo in Japanese. It's a Japanese form that was developed around the turn of the century. And how do the figures actually operate? The puppeteer sits on this wooden stool with wheels and is able to move about the stage freely. Uh, the puppet is suspended out in front of me on a harness. The head is moved by strings that are attached to my head. I grab the hands and I slip into these shoes which are attached to the puppet's heels. Wonderful. I'm incredibly excited that you're on the show. Thanks. I think I'm on. Tonight, Bruce will demonstrate this rare form of puppetry, showing us the dance of a courtesan who becomes inhabited by a demon spirit. from a long tradition of lightning calculators like Zara Colburn, Jedediah Buxton, and Johan Zachariah Dace, the person you would have paid to sit next to you in algebra, the woman who holds the Guinness record for multiplying two 13-digit numbers together faster than it's taken me to do this introduction, all the way from Bangalore, India, Shakuntala Devi. Thanks very much.
We've also brought here friends of mine from UCLA, Professor Don Eldesacker, statistician, and his assistant, Chris Ferguson, who will generate random numbers on the computer. Shakuntala is going to start by doing what are known in mathematics as root extractions, which have nothing to do with pulling teeth. <laughs> so we're going to start with uh, a number of, say, six or seven digits, and I'm going to ask for you to generate a number for me now. Uh, this is a nine-digit number. Nine-digit number, okay. Nine digits you're going to do? Cube, Cube root eight, of a nine-digit nine. number. Eight, eight, four, nine. Eight, four, nine. Two, seven, eight. Two, seven, eight. One, two, three. One, two, three. The answer to this number is uh, 947. Is it correct? 947 is what we do. 947 is correct. Shall we try another number of uh, nine or ten digits, uh, Don? Uh, ten digits. Ten digit uh, cube root. Digit cube root. Cube root. Ten digits. Ten digits. All right, here we go. Two, one, eight. Two, one, eight. Six, eight, seven. Six, eight, just, just a seven. Just a moment. Uh, yes, that's okay. Okay. Five, yeah. five, five, nine, two. Five, five, nine, two. One, two, nine, two. Eight is the answer. One, two, nine, eight. One, two, nine, eight is correct. That's really correct. Thank you, thank you so very much. Thank you. Very, very Can I ask you to do a fourth root? Oh, yes, why not? A fourth root is a number multiplied by itself, by itself, Four by times. itself, and by itself again. Right. Four times. So we're going to do a fourth root of a number of how many digits, Don? Eight digits. Of eight digits. Six, eight, five. Six, eight, five. Seven four nine. Seven four nine. Six one. Six one. Remember, Shakuntala has never seen these numbers before. Ninety one is the answer. Ninety one. That is astounding. Very, 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 not all the great performers were flesh and blood. Take a look at these unusual entertainers. Their brains are clockwork, their muscles springs. For centuries, we've marveled at the mechanical virtuosos known as automata. Now we'd like you to meet a man who creates and restores them, John Gaunt. John, I see you brought Antonio Diavolo, one of the great figures in the history of automaton made by Robert Houdin, the great French magician. Over 140 years ago in Paris. That's truly remarkable. And he performed almost every night for 50 years. Well, we're in store for a true treat. Here we have a piece built by the most famous magician of the 19th century, restored to its original condition from more than hundreds of pieces, and about ready to command our attention the way it commanded the attention of royalty 140 years ago. Yeah, really exciting. Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, why don't we journey back and see what an audience might have seen in an elegant Parisian theater in 1847. Please welcome John Gaughan and performing his polandric evolutions, that terpsichore of the trapeze, Antonio Diavolo. Antonio, are you holding on? You're not afraid of falling, are you? Then would you bow and we'll commence with the routine? Well done. Oh.
actually straighten out his leg. Ice cream. Antonio, would you straighten out your legs, please? And the other? Oh. Very impressive. Really wonderful. Do you think we could talk Antonio into doing an encore? Yes, he would love to. Should I start the bar? Uh, he should start it himself this time. That would be impressive. Come on, Antonio. It's really hard to believe that this was a bunch of broken parts in a box which I saw in your shop seven years ago. We should point out there's absolutely no electronic trickery here whatsoever. The same as it was 140 years ago. Truly remarkable. What may appear at first to be an array of ordinary glasses is in fact a musical instrument of unparalleled beauty, at least when it's in the hands of a virtuoso like Jamie Turner. Jamie, how Thank do you, you manage to produce music with these glasses? You may have seen some people do this. You dip your fingers in water and rub them around the rims of the glasses. Well, I've never heard it sound that good. Are these special glasses? These are perfectly ordinary glass, but I use only distilled water. Huh. It gives you the finest tone quality. And this is actually a musical instrument? Oh, yes. The name of it is glass harmonica or glass harp. Benjamin Franklin invented a version of it in 1761 in London. Mozart wrote two pieces for it in Vienna in 1791. I can do anything on it from symphonic solo pieces to ragtime. Well, then I suppose all you need is a proper introduction. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, the titan of tintinabulation. The man whose thirst remains unquenched for your musical pleasure, performing Beethoven's Ode to Joy, welcome, if you will, Jamie Turner.
in a moment, the magical conclusion of Learned Pigs and Fireproof Women. Ricky J. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the wonderful performers who appeared here. Special thanks to our guest stars, Steve Martin, Elaine Boozler, and Matt Biondi. Tonight I've had the great personal pleasure of bringing you a glimpse of a world that has always captivated me. In any field, when a special level of artistry is reached, it's often called magical. We hope you've experienced a little bit of that magic this evening. This is Paula Zahn. And I'm Harry Smith. The world has entered a decade of change. So wake up to the 90s with us weekdays on CBS This Morning. Stay tuned for your local news. Action speaks louder than words.